Hey, Willie, welcome to the Beyond Jaws podcast. Are you ready to talk about sharks? You bet. I've been looking forward to this. Thanks a lot. Nice. Love it. Love it. I'm really excited today. We have we have uh, Professor Willie Bemis. He's currently a professor at Cornell University as our guest today. Been so wanting to have Willie on to talk about a whole range of things. But just a little background is uh, Willie did his uh, bachelor's degree uh, in biology at Cornell University. And then from there, he went on and did a, a master's of science at the University of Michigan. And then he came out to the West Coast at University of California, Berkeley, which is kind of in my neighborhood. Um, and then he went on and did a postdoc at the uh, University of Chicago. And his career's been kind of varied, actually. He, did a, he was a professor of biology at University of Massachusetts at, at Amherst for many years. He served as a director of the Shoals Marine Laboratory for about, I think, almost 10 years or so before retiring. And now he's a professor emeritus at University of Amherst, but he's also a professor still active and still very much teaching at Cornell University. And uh, Willie's a, a, a background and research focus on anatomy, development, and evolutionary relationships of fossil fishes, including sharks, lungfishes, and coelacanths, which we got to talk about today as well. And uh, I can go on with it, but Willie, welcome to the show. Dave, I really appreciate the invitation. You know, uh, I have such happy times in my life, and you know, so many of them revolved revolved around things that I did in California. So I'm going to tell you some of that stuff today because that's kind of fun. How did you get first interested in fishes or sharks and coelacanths, and how did you get interested in it? So I was really lucky as a kid. I grew up near Toledo, Ohio, which is about as far from the ocean as you can imagine. Um, we have Lake Erie and it's wonderful, but you know, I was a freshwater fisherman all my childhood. That was a lot of fun, but my family took lots of vacations to Florida. Um, and we would go to places like Sanibel before there was a bridge, you know, and when they built the bridge, my dad said, it's getting too civilized here. We better go somewhere else. So we used to go to the keys a lot when I was, uh, when I was in, you know, middle school, high school type times. And I was absolutely fascinated by marine invertebrates. I picked them, picked up shells all over the place. You know, I learned to snorkel and, and explore things. I had a wonderful time as a kid. And I also kept lots of fish when I was growing up. I had many aquaria and I was sort of, you know, into cichlids after a fashion, but I looked at almost everything I was interested in and in fish keeping. When I came to Cornell, I thought probably I would study marine invertebrates, but it turned out that the marine invertebrates course wasn't being taught the first semester I was here back in 1972, 50 years ago this semester. And uh, so uh, some advisor or another said, well, why don't you go talk to Harvey Poe? He's teaching the vertebrates class. Maybe he'll let you in. It's normally not something they do, but maybe you can cajole him into taking you into the class. So I met Harvey. And that was a life-changing moment for me because I got into his class and I studied vertebrates with him. The first fish we dissected was, of course, a spiny dogfish. And I fell in love with the anatomy of spiny dogfish because we had basically, in those days, uh, dissection labs were twice a week and you worked for weeks on a specimen. And so I got so fascinated by shark anatomy and biology based on this Classroom experience, 50 years ago to this, this time, it's just amazing to me that's already 50 years have gone by. So, um, you know, fast forwarding, I really decided to study uh, fishes for my dissertation work at Berkeley. For my time at Michigan, we worked on penguins. That was fun because we'd go to the Detroit Zoo every morning early and film the penguins in the Penguinarium, if you can believe it. There's a place called the Penguinarium. And it was perfect. They had seven species of penguins. We studied them in that tank. It was just amazing. We were looking at how they swim, how fast they swim, and how it's related to their wing beats. And it was a, it's still a paper that people cite. It's, uh, you know, it's an interesting study we did. Just kind of backed into it because we were on a class trip to the, to the zoo, you know, and I said, well, we ought to work on this. So at any rate, um, I, I started my, my work on fishes at Berkeley working on lung fishes. Uh, which are fascinating, fascinating animals, among my very favorite organisms, really. Um, and I, I did a lot of work um, in museums and, and collections, working with both fossil and recent lung fishes. But, but I got a great trip out of it. I, I got to East Africa to collect in Lake Victoria, and I got to, to Australia, uh, where we, we collected two Australian lung fishes from the Brisbane River. So these were really formative experiences, and I just, you know, I really had a great time with that. Um, but as to sharks and my own kind of, you know, proclivities here, I would say that 
although I teach ichthyology and I, it's my favorite course to teach, I'm teaching it right now. Um, I am more of a whole vertebrates guy. I like all vertebrates, right? And I've published on mammals and penguins and frogs and salamanders and, you know, snakes and, and lots of fishes. And so my interests have been very broad. And I think that relates very much to um, those experiences 50 years ago in Harvey Poe's class. So the, the, the sharks have come in for me as I wanted to talk about sharks to teach general principles of vertebrate biology. And that's what our course at Shoals was all about when Dominique and I were teaching out there. And that's what Shark Mook was about. We were using the biology of sharks, fascinating, fascinating animals, to help people understand larger issues in vertebrate zoology. So I'm going to just do the full circle on this and tell you that this spring, the 11th edition of the, our textbook, Vertebrate Life, came out, published by Oxford University Press. And for this 11th edition, my wife, Betty McGuire, and I joined Harvey and Christine Jana. So 50 years ago, the guy who got me involved in this business, I co-authored a textbook with him. And it was very exciting. It was a ton of fun. So, But that's sort of the big picture. Now, I, I have to ask, you know, you, I'm looking over your your CV here and uh, on, the, on the Cornell website. You know, you talk about loving vertebrates and, and you know, talking about penguins and so forth. But your, your ability to publish on a lot of different fish, you know, and a lot of different marine species is uncanny. Like, what drove it? Like, I'm, I'm looking at here, you know, some of them... Uh, you know, stuff that people don't normally publish on that you don't see, you know what I mean? Like uh, Atlantic cutlass fish, hagfish, you know, people, when they take a look at hagfish, they think it's like a monster movie, you know, and, and how disgusting they are. Yeah. Is that an interest of yours to kind of go with, you know, you talk about sharks being unique in the way, you know, their anatomy and, and things. Is that something that drives you and you, like in your passion to find out more about the different anatomies of different marine species? I became an anatomist. I was thinking, I was trying to think very clearly when I was a young person, right, about what kind of career did I really want for myself? And I tell everybody, I've got the best job in the world. I get to get up every morning and think about fish. And, you know, that's pretty true. I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful job. And uh, nobody's ever told me what fish to think about. Nobody really cares, you know. So uh, that, my, my ability to, to work on anything I want has been one of the best aspects of, of my career. And the reason anatomy is so good is that unlike other disciplines, you don't peak as an anatomist in your 20s, 30s, or 40s. I'm still not there yet. I'm, you know, in my late 60s, and I learn new stuff about anatomy every day of the year. And it's, it's wonderful because I, I need very small equipment. I need a camera. You know, I need, need access to equipment like CT machines, but, you know, they're kind of at the core of facilities now, you can get access to them very easily. Um, I don't need a lot of money. You know, I collect my own specimens by and large. And so this has made it possible for me to have a career that I think has been exceptionally rewarding to me and I hope useful to, to some of the people I've trained um, without having to have huge grants. And I do see that as a strategy um, because, to be very honest with you, I, I worked at NSF for a while. Uh, I went there. This is a funny story. I went there after I after I'd had seven grants rejected in a row. <laughs> <laughs> when you can't win them, join them, I guess, right? <laughs> no, I, well, I called up my program officer. He's a really interesting man, and I said, "Listen, I think I better come down and, and work for you, so I could figure out what the heck I'm doing wrong." And he said, "Can you come now?" And I said, "Well, no, I can't. I'm thinking two years." And he says, "That's what everybody says." So six months later, he gave me a call, and he said. How about now? And I said, well, I'm having a fight with my dean, so I'll just go home and ask my wife and make sure this is okay. So I ended up going to NSF, and I found out what I was doing wrong. There isn't enough money. And we need to actually support the careers of younger people coming up. And, you know, these were good grants. I don't have any doubt that they were wonderful projects. Some, some I ended up doing anyway. Who cares? You know, if I can get away with it and do it without any money, that's fine. But... Um, you know, I, I really, I really had respect for uh, what the NSF was was doing, 
in terms of trying to funnel the resources to the youngest people possible. And while I don't think that they've stayed quite as true to that mission as I might have liked them to, it is always a factor to try to make sure that the next generation has support coming up. And meanwhile, I just go on like, you know, the whatever that Energizer bunny is, I, I don't really have, you know, huge expenses to do what I do. So let me ask you this from an academic point of view. You know, a lot of, and I, I didn't work as a professor, and I don't have my PhD. So I'm always curious about this because I hear different stories. If you don't bring in big grants, does that go against, like, does the university not like that? Like, as a professor, if you don't bring in the money, does the university kind of see, oh, well, he's not bringing, even though he's publishing or someone's publishing, does that go against? So, you know, that's, a, that's actually a really important question to ask. I've been fortunate to be in tenure system positions at both UMass and here at Cornell. And the, the privilege of tenure is not granted lightly. It's a, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's sort of a mountain, um, for most of us. Um, but, uh, I made an agreement with my department at UMass. I said, look, I'm going to publish fewer, longer papers, um, with the goal that people will still be reading them 30 years from now. And my chair at UMass, a wonderful man said, yes, that's fine with him. So he was encouraging my scholarship, knowing that, you know, I probably would never, I think in some total, I probably only brought in a couple million bucks, which is nothing for an academic to do, right? Um, I mean, I have colleagues who have, you know, tens of millions of dollars, but they're supporting research labs that are working on very, very specific topics of great public interest. So it's a, it's a different matter to convince somebody that you need some money to collect hagfish, you know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> to convince anybody you, can, you need to collect yeah. hagfish. Well, you, you mentioned something interesting, Will, I wanted to t- touch on, you know, because today, and I know when I started out, it wasn't this way, but, you know, they, there's a real push for on younger people coming up to publish in certain journals for impact factor. And my attitude, the uh, people I grew up with were my mentors to me was like, a good paper is going to get cited wherever you publish it. If it's a good paper, it'll get cited. Um, it doesn't matter what the journal is because a, a, a mediocre paper is just going to be forgotten and 90% of papers are forgotten within five years. Yeah. I, I agree, Dave. I, that's the system my experience too. And there was a degree of honor and scholarship that, that I experienced from the people who mentored me that uh, I tried to instill in the students I'm training today. Um, but I, I do, I do think that institutions you know, it's really hard. I've served on a lot of evaluation committees. It's really hard to say, well, this particular person um, published three papers uh, in the last three years, which is lower than we'd like to see. But they're all huge studies. And I want to recognize that and make sure that this person gets promoted. You know, and it's actually a very funny story. I, I can't name the person, I don't think, but it's very peculiar. The guy I replaced at UMass was promptly hired by Cornell. And the reason they didn't, they didn't retain him at UMass is because they said his publication rate was too low. And he came to Cornell and published six papers immediately from the work he'd done at UMass. And they established him as a leading researcher in that field for the rest of his life. So I think it's very it's very dangerous to assume that publication rate has somehow closely linked to quality. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So how do you how do you figure a paper is going to have that long lasting effect down the road? So we had several strategies for that when we were working on various groups in the 90s in particular, but still to this day. Um, the key thing about a paper for me are the illustrations. So I spent a lot of time you know, working on photographs and drawings and, and, you know, statistical graphs and whatever else it might be. And, you know, if, if you're seeing this now with journals, they have a uh, so-called graphical abstracts where the graphic displays in sort of single form what the paper's about. And I think it's a really clever way to do this because basically when I've pitched my papers, I'm not pitching text to people. I'm showing them the figures. Say, this is what I think you should see. Um, 
And so many of our things have been really lavishly illustrated, like this textbook. And I hate to go back to it, but I just want to point out, I did the art for the book. There are 473 figures in the book. Each figure typically has two to four parts. In aggregate, we wound up with 12, what was it? Like I, I'm going to get the numbers wrong if I try to go for it, but basically almost 2,000 individual figure parts that I worked on for two years. And of those, 800 were new to this edition. So that says something about the way our communication is happening. It's very visual, particularly if you're talking about anatomy or ecology or any of the topics that I want to talk about. And the better the figure, the more attention the, the, the work will get. So going back to this, how do, how do you pitch, mon, uh, pitch monographs? Well, we pitched monographs. We said we're going to write a revisionary study on bowfins, very important group of fishes, one living species, unless you believe my colleague in, in Syracuse who says there are many, and I think probably has good evidence for that. But one, one living species at the time that we were working on this, and lots and lots and lots of fossils from all over the world, right? So um, we were able to put together a comprehensive review of bowfins of the world from the Mesozoic to now. And that, pa that paper, I think it's been cited 700 times, which is amazing to me. Yeah, no, I think that's really important. Like I said, I was fortunate that m my advisors or mentors all said that just get it published because you can have the greatest, you never know what people are going to pick up on. And, and rather than having people reinvent the wheel, if you get it out there, it's out there. And I, I know I've had some papers that I, I mainly want to get the information out there. And then they ended up getting cited quite a bit. And I didn't even think that they get cited that much. And then other papers, I thought, oh, this is going to be a really well-cited paper doesn't get that many citations compared. So you just, in my experience, you should never know. You never know. But if you're doing a new species description, for example, that's going to be cited indefinitely because it, you know, it always has to be cited if, they, if it's talking about that species. So that's one of the things I think is so cool about the Lost Shark Project, by the way. I mean, I think, you know, people don't really understand how we start to look at species, uh, you know, from, from, a, from a rigorous perspective. And I think that program of yours calls attention to that so well. So I'm excited that you're doing it. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, let's, let, one thing I want to talk, we talked a little bit earlier before we went on air is that some of the people you've met uh, throughout your uh, career, oh my and gosh. some of the people, ha they happen to have been people that were formative in my career. We mentioned like you're we out in Berkeley, we talk, were talking, you, you met Leonard Campagno. Yeah, no. So this was actually one of the most, you know, memorable days in a, in a long life. And uh, I'm going to try to abbreviate it a little bit because a lot happened on that particular day. But uh, Leonard had this lab over in Tiburon. Um, and Tiburon, you know, is an absolutely beautiful place. Uh, just gorgeous, gorgeous spot. And then there's this little marine lab that's just basically down on the waterfront. And it was a, I guess it was a coaling station originally or something, but it had been converted to this environmental center. And there were Quonset huts there uh, off the parking lot. And uh, do you remember Leonard's Quonset hut? Oh, yeah. Well, it, well, well I could, if I just fill people in, that was originally, it, there were military barracks during World War II. It was, it was a military station. Then it got converted over afterwards, and Leonard had taken over one of the military barracks there. Well, that was his lab, and it was part of the San Francisco State University Marine Lab. And I think Noah Fisheries had a little office, and there was these empty barracks, and Leonard took one over. And just so people know, Tiburon, Tiburon is in Marin County, which is probably one of the most expensive, exclusive neighborhoods in the country. Um, so um, anyway, so you had this guy here who just finished his degree at Stanford living in a Quonset hut, basically. So It was truly memorable because the Quonset hut was divided into four rooms, as I recall. One of the rooms was his office, and he was a terrific collector of literature. And so the walls were just covered with books. And then behind that, on that side of the Quonset building, was um, his, his series of 55-gallon drums filled with dissection specimens. Is that what you recall? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Then on the other half of the Quonset hut, he had a garage for fixing his car. Which is a little black Volkswagen bug. That's what I'm remembering. I, I was pretty sure it was a bug. And uh, then he had his drawing and photographic work in the sort of back half of that so he'd dissect, I guess, over there and, and use, his, use his equipment to make photographs and drawings. Is that, that what you recall? Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. I knew the place well. 
Yeah. So I, the reason why I was visiting him is because I had a colleague and friend, Gareth Nelson from the American Museum of Natural History, who was an informal mentor of mine during graduate school because there were no really great fish systematists at Cornell at the time. But Gareth was one of the best in the world. He was really, really, I had so much fun with him. And he said, let's go over and visit Leonard. So that's the reason we did it. And the reason Gareth wanted to visit Leonard was because Leonard had figured out how to do cladistics on his own on the West Coast. And Gareth had brought, you know, methodology from Sweden back from his postdoc there to the American Museum of Natural History when he took his curatorship there in the late 60s. So this is really like for for Gareth, he wanted to figure out how did Leonard um, learn about this and how, how did he apply his flavor of phylogenetic systematics to questions about relationships of elasmobranchs. And it's really actually a very interesting story from the perspective of the history of, of phylogenetic systematics because um, there are lots of different opinions about how to proceed and Leonard was sort of in his own space. And it was really exciting to be there and to see, to sort of witness this, uh, this little piece of, of phylogenetic systematics history, which was really hot at the time, really hot. I can tell just people know, and you, you hit on it in that. I, and I tell people this, that Leonard was, if you ever, people want to stand out when they feel now, especially young people want to do something unique. Well, Leonard was one of those guys that he didn't run with the herd or swim with the school. That guy stood out on his own. He was an outside the box thinker. If everybody was doing one thing, Leonard was doing something else and unique. And uh, he was just, he, he operated his own space out there. And that's, if you want to get ahead in any field, whatever it is, you need to think outside the box. Because if you're going to just do what everyone else is, you're, you're just going to be just another face in the crowd. Um, and that was Leonard. Yeah, he, he really was a standout. And, you know, he had that great paper. We had one paper in the 1973 Interrelationships of Fishes, which was very influential. I read that book cover to cover many times. I was just completely focused on it. And then the 1977 symposium at the ASZ, the American Society of Zoologists had a shark symposium. And that collection of papers from that symposium, they were just remarkably interesting papers. And his paper on phylogenetics of sharks from that paper really you know, set the stage for a lot of things that came later. I was going to say that, and just again, if you're, especially young people listening, it really helps to know sort of your history and fishes and chondrichthines and sharks. But Leonard's 1973 paper, which was in a book on interrelationships of fishes, and then he published it in the journal that Willie just mentioned in 1977, same thing on phylogenetic. That pa those papers still hold up today with, now that we're using genetics and all these new tools, the papers still, all the genetic stuff they're doing now, it still holds up. He, he, Leonard hit on it back in the 70s with no genetic tools, just all morphological cladistic analysis and everything. And it's still, that's crazy. I think about 50 years later, that still holds up today. That, that, that's, that's really a testament to the kind of research uh, Leonard did back in that time, in that era. No, and I, you know, he, he did a great paper on lambiform relationships that I've studied extensively. I think it was the 92, uh, 92 uh, uh, symposium. Um, and honestly, you know, when you see somebody like that making a difference, um, really, <laughs> it was, he was an inspiring guy. Yeah, I, I just, I, yeah. I think I've told the story in the podcast before, but I was doing my master's degree and I was using the uh, Boston Whaler out of the San Francisco State University Marine Lab, which is right next door to where Leonard oh was gosh. hiding out. I remember coming in one day and I knew Leonard was there, but I didn't, I didn't know him or anything. I didn't know what he looked like or anything. And I came in one day, it was a miserable day. Their seas were up, it was raining. We just caught a few dogfish. And this guy walks by and he takes a look in the boat and he sees some dogfish in there. And I just said, oh, I'm working on seven gill sharks in the bay there. And he gets all this look on his face like, oh, I didn't know that he was working on seven gill sharks. And then we end up spending two hours in the pouring down rain talking about sharks. And I finally said, can we step out of the rain here? He goes, oh, yeah, sure. No problem. Come over to my office. And that and from there is how <laughs> I mean, that was Leonard. He's just stood in the pouring that, rain and just he just wanted to start talking yeah. about sharks. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I think that that's a wonderful story. That's absolutely wonderful. He published the 1984 shark catalog of the sharks of the world with the FAO, which anyone in the field, you should know what that is. Uh, it's it's critical. Where he was working on that in 1982 when I first met him. And 
you talk about how his office was divided up. He literally had different stations. He had the illustration station, the writing station, the dissection station, and then his auto shop where he used to work on his little black Volkswagen Beetle bug. And uh, it was an incredible thing to see. It was, and, uh, and that's kind of how I, my, whole, my whole journey started with him back in about 1982. It was just like running into this guy in a pouring rain. That's so, so cool. That's a really great story. I think our visit was maybe a couple years before that because I left Berkeley in 1982. Yeah, he'd been there for a while. Yeah, he'd been there for several years by the time I, I visited him. But that's fun to think about. You know, um, I think our business has had so many interesting people. And I, uh, you know, I, 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 I like the title of this series, Beyond Jaws, because, of course, Jaws came out when I was in college. And um, I'll tell you a funny story about that movie. Um, I didn't see it right away. I don't know what was wrong with me that I didn't see it right away, but I didn't. And um, several years later, when I finally did watch it, it became like one of my all time favorite movies. It's just nuts. How you know, it, it's campy and, and, and funny and silly and stuff. But I just love it. I love the movie. So when I used to take my students from UMass to the Boston Aquarium, the New England Aquarium there, uh, I take them every year on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, because that's when the aquarium's least crowded. Nobody goes to the aquarium the day before Thanksgiving. And I could give them a free bus ride to Boston, where a lot of them lived. So we go to the aquarium on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And the ritual was you watched uh, Jaws and A Fish Called Wanda. Those were our two bus movies in those years going back and forth. And, you know, it was amazing how exposing these younger people to uh, to that movie, most of them hadn't seen it, right? Because it's 20 years later. But honestly, those are fun times to think about. So I want to say something about students. I mean, I think one of the things that, that's still very exciting to me and, and the reason why I'm still teaching is because I had such wonderful experiences with my students. And you were asking about how did I get to work on all these different types of fishes and stuff? Well, one of the reasons is because I've had a lot of students Right. And so one of my students, Kat Lee, uh, was the woman I studied hagfish with because she wanted to do a research project as an undergraduate. We were at Shoals. Hagfishes are abundant there, easy to collect, da 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 da. And so we did a very simple experiment uh, to see what their food preferences were, whether they liked fish or crustaceans or mollusks. So we'd grind up pieces of fish, crabs, and uh, I guess we were using quahogs or something for the, uh, but whatever we were using, we had these three different baits. What would you predict? Ooh. I would say the, the core hogs, like the, like the, the invertebrates. Yeah. Okay. Dave, you got an idea about this? Not a clue. You gotta pick one. Yeah. Come on. Gotta pick okay. one, Dave. Okay. Uh, the, the, the quokka, I, I don't, I just don't know. I'm just. Okay. So, they, uh, uh, they really preferred the fish. Mm. There was no question about it. And it, it, you know, in doing this, if you think about what the different baits were all about, I mean, one of the things about the fish is that they're very oily because we were using, uh, using herring. And the oil um, you know, disperses through the water. And hagfish don't really have eyes to speak of. They have a little, little, little sensitivity to light, but they, their eyes are very, very reduced. But they have very, very uh, <laughs> upsized, if you will, olfactory systems. So our speculation is that this was related to uh, the ability to follow an odor plume of the, the oil from, from the fish baits. So that was a really fun project uh, for all kinds of reasons. First, it's just fun to work with hagfish. I mean, they are fascinating animals. And uh, yeah, they're I mean, one of my favorite things to do with, with students is to take them out and collect hagfish, and they all get excited about handling hagfish slime, you know? It's, it's exciting and disgusting yeah. and fascinating <laughs> and everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. So, I, just going back to the students in general, I, I have an observation that we were talking about before we got on here, and it, it has to do with, you know, what's happened after COVID. Okay, so March 2020, um, we converted in a day to online for my vertebrates class, my wife and I did. And um, 
mm-hmm. remote learning, you know, just no issue for us because we like the technology. And that was fun, right? But the thing that you can't do remotely is to give students firsthand experience with research. And so what I'm observing now in uh, now that we're fully back in operation here is that I have more undergraduates than ever who want to know about uh, firsthand research experiences. And I think I have eight or nine students doing readings or hands-on research with me this semester, which is more than I've ever had in a semester in my life. And so I am, I'm very optimistic about the future with regard to uh, the young people who are coming into our fields. Um, they bring tremendous enthusiasm. And one of the, one of the sort of un, unrecognized things about having instant access to all kinds of information, I mean, we all, you know, for those of us who grew up with no internet and then have the internet we have today, I mean, I can see all the dramatic changes it's made in my approach to research. Right. And I'm very aware of that. But these students who've grown up entirely with the Internet, I mean, they're they're amazing. I had a student this morning tell me about a project that we developed as a little sidebar conversation in class last month. And he went out and did all the research necessary to answer this question, which involved doing some fairly complicated math. And I just like pulled it all together in like two weeks, you know, so. I, I think this is a this is a very positive sign for what our, our what our future in, in sciences is going to be like. So, Willie, do you think that people are are just uh, you know they they've been cooped up inside, not learning, so they just have this hunger for learning and and hunger for trying to uh, just like you said get that research experience, and and they're they're just going to go out, they're just going out, and they just want to do as much as possible. I think that is part of it. Um, you know. I was very fortunate because I was able to do undergraduate research when I was here. I studied frog locomotion. I studied frog jumping. It was just crazy. I, I measured the lengths of different frogs and related it to how far they could jump. <laughs> and it was actually really fun stuff, and I love doing it. But, um, but what I guess I'm saying is, you know, people have the research bug um, more intensively than I've seen. And I don't know what that's all about. I mean, some of it's being cooped up. But I think also just the flow of information is such that people are made aware of how important research is. Like, it's kind of funny to me, but I, you know, I, I, I find a lot of science on Apple News, right? And if often I, I learn about really important papers that came out yesterday because they're featured in Apple News. And I'm like, that's pretty cool. I mean... It used to be a real difficult job to keep up with the literature. And- well, speaking of you know, students and stuff, you know, well, we've had two of your two of your uh, students who were you're, you're very instrumental as mentors on the show. We had uh, Dominic Didier on uh, episode five, and uh, recently we had Josh Moyer on episode thirty. And obviously, both of them were, uh, spoke very highly of you. And anyone listening, I'd encourage you to go check out those episodes. And just to give you kind of the flow of of how incestuous the field could be is that uh, Dominique was a student. Uh, was she both an undergrad and a graduate student of yours? No, she she did her undergrad degree in in Illinois, and then came to UMass as a PhD student. Yeah, yeah. Well, then well then Josh became was an undergraduate student of Dominique's, and Josh found his way to Willie's lab. I think car- partly through Dominique, and now then of course Josh and Willie started up the Shark MOOC, and Josh is now teaching at uh, Yale. So it's just kind of an interesting sort of a career, kind of career life circle coming coming full circle um, on everything. It is fun, isn't it? I mean, it, it is kind of fun. And it's not that uncommon, actually. Um, one thing I do want to acknowledge, though, so, you know, Josh's real inspiration was the answer he got to his letter. Yeah. Which I think you covered in that podcast. Yeah. From your, and I'm not going to spoil it. You have yeah. to go listen to the yeah, podcast. Exactly. Yeah, good point. Yeah, go listen to the podcast. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was really good. But I will say that, you know, one of the things that uh, I think uh, that spoke a lot was Dominique named a, a ghost shark, a chimera after you. <laughs> yes, that was very sweet of her. That was really sweet of her. And, I, I, she, you know, I mean, Dominique was just an amazing student. I, I felt so lucky really just uh, uh, unbelievably lucky to have such a student. She was my first PhD student to finish. And um, we had, uh, how do we, I met her because she, she had dissected a ratfish in comparative anatomy uh, in Illinois. 
And she came to uh, UMass to work with my great friend and colleague, Dave Klingener, who was primarily a mammalian anatomist, but you know she was interested in anatomy. That was why she, she came. But after a while, she, she said, she came up to my lab and said, um, do you know anything about ratfishes? <laughs> I'm like, a little. And she said, uh, well, I think I'd like to work on ratfishes. I really liked them when I was an undergraduate. And I said, well, I know where to get them. And she said, you do? And I said, yeah, we'll just go to Friday Harbor. Because at Friday Harbor in the 80s, that was where the ratfish were. They're not so close to the islands anymore. They're, they're another part of Puget Sound, apparently. But they were easy to catch. So we, uh, we went out there. We spent seven or eight weeks there uh, in the spring of 87. And so we, we had a wonderful time. I was just, I loved it out there. And it was great to be with, I had another graduate student along with us and the three of us drove across country nonstop and all the usual things that crazy young people do. But we had a lot of fun and collected a lot of fish, learned a ton of things. And then on the way back, we stopped in Wyoming uh, to work at my colleague Lance Grandy's site there in the Green River Formation. So we were collecting fossil fishes in Wyoming on the way home. So it was a really formative trip for all of us in many ways. And then Dominique got a Fulbright. She went off to New Zealand. And that's probably in that podcast with her. So I'll let that, you should go to listen about that because she's, she has great stories. She's been one of the most accomplished, certainly the most, one of the most accomplished uh, chondrichthian taxonomists, certainly on ghost sharks. There's, there's no one who's done more than she has on, on chondrichthian or on, on uh, ghost shark chimera taxonomy than anyone than her. And I've been fortunate because I've had some of my grad students have had the opportunity to work and collaborate with her as well. And she's been amazing. She is. She really is. And fearless. You know, one of the, one of the wonderful things about, about her is that she just takes everything head on and just deals with it, you know. So I'm very, very, very proud of her. I always talk about her in my classes, of course. And Josh, I mean, you know, Josh came into my life because he was teaching he took and then he taught the sharks course at Shoals when Dominique and I were doing that. And then he came back here and worked for me here. And then he got into the master's program. He did a master's in a year and a half and it was a great piece of work. Um, five, four or five pubs came out of that for, for a master's really unusual. Um, you know, and he's, he's a very, very thoughtful scientist. Um, and I, I'm super impressed with what he's done both his time at UMass and now on to Yale. This is just great stuff. But you know, the thing is, there's a lot of, there's a lot of really wonderful stuff happening in ichthyology right now. Um, I think one of the ways that I've been, you know, I don't want to get too family here, but our daughter, Kate, uh, Kate Bemis is, is an ichthyologist as well. And so the fact that she, she did her undergraduate here so, you know, I was around when she was doing her undergraduate research and we worked on it together and blah, 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 blah. Then she went off to study with Eric Hilton, who was a former PhD student of mine. And he's down in Virginia at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And I love that place. It's just fantastic. It's absolutely wonderful. Sarah and Eric have, uh, you know, really made ichthyology. A, it, I mean, it's, it's tough, tough shoes to follow. I mean, Jack Music, right? Uh, but they're... And on all the other really famous, wonderful people, but they had they have a wonderful system going down there, and I think Kate just flourished with that. And so most mornings when I get up to think about fishes, I talk to Kate because we talk about fishes nearly every day. And so I'm she's my kind of finger on the pulse for what's happening with people in her age group. Um, and now you know she's training her own students, so we'll see what happens. There'll be more generations of of young ichthyologists, I hope. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear and stuff. So what, why don't you, we talked to Josh a bit about the shark mook and stuff, but maybe you could just uh, fill us in a little more, talk a little more about kind of the origin of it a little bit and uh, kind of the history and what's your vision going forward? Well, my vision for it going forward is that Josh should take it over. <laughs> and I, I think you hear that, Josh? That that's going You're to taking happen. it over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know Josh is listening. <laughs> I think we've agreed on that. You know, honestly, uh, uh, my my hope is that that Josh will be able to continue to develop the the MOOC, um, which is something I'm really probably not in a position to do at this moment in my life. You know, um, and uh, it needs it 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 needs uh, 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 a younger. 
uh, person to really make it bloom, you know? So I hope that that comes to pass. But the way it got started was, you know, I've been teaching this sharks course out on Appledore with Dominique for a while. She had to step back from that. I continued to do it for a little bit longer with Josh. Um, I don't actually remember the last time we did it. It might've been 2013. I don't remember. Probably was 2013. If not, it's 2012. At any rate, um, I, you know, I had this, this goal that I was going to teach vertebrate biology using sharks as examples because everybody wants to know more about sharks. And we thought this would be a good way to, to do this. And we, we deliberately called it shark mook and started it during shark week, hoping that the alliteration would somehow make people notice us, you know. Um, we applied for some funding for it in 2013 because Cornell was thinking they would be be investing in MOOCs and we didn't get selected that year. But the next year, someone told me to apply again and we did get the, the funding to make it happen. And so we started in the spring of 2015 and Josh and several other people and I would get together. We spent eight weeks just designing the uh, sort of the learning objectives for the course, if you will. And this was my first intense time dealing with, you know, what are you really trying to get people to learn from this? And we had experts from the, the learning center here at Cornell who worked with us very closely to help sort of decide the, the morphology of this project, you know, how long it was going to be. We saw it was four weeks, how many episodes or, you know, where, where they're going to be, blah, 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 all that stuff. And so we started with a good sort of uh, teaching plan. And then we spent about a year uh, developing all the material. And Josh was completely instrumental in that. He worked on the funds that we'd obtained. Uh, and, you know, we did, I think we made in the end 82 videos or something. So it was a non-trivial amount of work. Um, but we also had all these drawings and all the information and topics that we wanted to cover. And I think it's actually done very well. I and mean, we've had something like 34 or 5,000 students take it so far um, over the years since 2016. What I like most about it is the global reach. I mean, we reach students in 182 countries, which is just amazing to me. I never thought I'd have that kind of reach, you know? So it was a great experiment for us. My wife, Betty McGuire, was also instrumental in making that course happen. You know, she worked with us. She's a terrific editor, and she worked with us to get our content to mean something and not just be a, a smear on the screen, you know? So, and she... She did all the evaluations for the course, which is really a big, big lift. Um, so we had a lot of fun doing it, and I'm really glad I did. But the sad thing, and I was talking about this a little bit earlier when we were just chatting, Cornell decided in 2016, uh, 2017, I guess, so it was 2016, 2017 academic year. So right after our first successful summer, which had like tens of thousands of students, it was amazing. I, I, they said, how many students do you expect to have? And I said, oh, I don't know, maybe 500. We had tens of thousands. What was that all about? You know, we hit something. Um, but Cornell decided to go in a different direction, and they canceled the MOOC uh, programming. And so Cornell's out of the business and has been now for, for several years. Um, we've still received excellent help from the Cornell uh, Teaching and Learning Center through those years. But... Um, it's like everything else. You need to, you need revenue in order to keep doing this because we need TAs and we need, you know, we need bandwidth and everything else. So there's, there's always a cost, um, which is one of the reasons why I think it's, it's going to need new leadership to really carry it going forward. It's not like a good way to pass the baton. You got someone like Josh, a young, eager guy coming up that's eager to get get into this stuff and, and all that. No, he's he's really remarkable. I did talk to Josh earlier. And he, he mentioned one of the other skills he learned from you was uh, doing woodwork. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I grew up at, in a house where if something broke, you you either fixed it or tried to fix it. Uh, if you needed to build something, you just built it because that's my father was an engineer. That's what that's the way he thought about the world. Right. So I grew up, you know, around tools and um and i love them i mean i'm i'm utterly fascinated by the tools that i've been able to acquire i have, to, I have a great time with them 
But Josh didn't have much experience, and, and I made him help me build a dissection table. That's cool. That's so cool. Yeah. So we had this, we had this uh, steel uh, lab bench that had rusted out. So I took it to the sandblaster I know, and he sandblasted it off. And then I had him powder coat it with white. So it's a beautiful white metal bench with no top. And I had Josh come over and I said, okay, we're going to build a top and we're going to paint it with epoxy so that we'll be able to dissect in this white table. We'll have the white background. It'll be perfect for photographs and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So I have still have paint spots on the driveway where we painted that thing with epoxy. That stuff never, <laughs> never goes away. <laughs> so yeah, no, that was a lot of fun. When you would take on a student like that and, and teach these skills, like, do you find that's part of your mentorship for graduate students? Because, I mean, there's the, the, there's the mentorship of the knowledge and getting through a graduate degree. Um, but there's also, you know, a lot of times you see graduate students learning instrument, like oceanographic instrumentation or how to jerry-rig a trap, uh, you know, to, ca to catch hagfish or, or whatever you need to catch. Like, do you find that's part of sort of the unique attributes that you provide as as a mentor, as a supervisor for your graduate students? And how important do you think that is for your graduate students? Well, I think those are really good questions. I mean, I think the first reaction I'd have is that every student's unique, you know? And uh, for example, one of my students now has more time at sea than I'll ever have, right? I mean, he worked for NOAA for 10 years uh, and was his more than a thousand days at sea, which is just a lot of time at sea. And, um, you know, so I'm never going to have that experience. But what I can help him with are things like, uh, I don't know, figure making is something that often falls to me to help with because I, I like figures, you know, and I think they're really important. Um, and then in other cases, you know, a student may have uh, really excellent skills in, in tracking down literature but not know how to organize that information in a way that could be most useful. So I think it depends on the student. And to a very large degree, I've been driven by the things that my students want to do. I got interested in ratfishes because Dominique wanted to study them, right? I'm, I find ratfishes fascinating, but it was Dominique that, that, that drove that. And just like the shark tooth work, that was Josh. He drove that. We did had a lot of fun. We, I learned a ton. I think we corrected some mistakes in the literature. And uh, I'm not working on shark teeth at the moment. And it's not because I'm not interested in them. It's because Josh isn't here, you know? So, and I learned some of the thing about this from a very famous man named Steve Wainwright, who was at Duke University. And the man studied anything, whatever his students brought him. So he had students who worked on, for example, the hold fast of kelp. How do they stay attached to the bottom? in these just ridiculous big currents that they're dealing with off the California coast. Uh, another student who uh, worked on uh, anemones and how they react to different flow regimes in the water. And on and on and on. His students worked on a variety of different functional, anatomical, behavioral, whatever they happen to be, invertebrates, plants, whatever. And, you know, he published a very important paper on shark skin, one of the most interesting papers ever written on shark skin, in my opinion, in which they showed the cross helical striations of the collagen fibers uh, in the skin. And that effectively allows the skin to operate something like an exotendon to move the tail back and forth. Very important paper and it's cover of science, but that's just one of you know, dozens and dozens of things he did. And I don't know whether he told me this or whether some of his, well, his students told me this, but I, I always thought that was such an interesting way to lead your life, to let the students show you where you ought to go. I think that's terrific that, you know, having that freedom to pursue something that your advisors like was, well, is up for that challenge, like whatever you bring them, that's what they're going to look, they'll, they'll, they'll learn about it. Um, I wish I was like, had that, that scope. I think a lot of people do, but that, that, that's, 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 that's amazing. I've been very lucky because I've had great students. I mean, that's really what it comes down to, you know, and great students will lead you in, in interesting directions. Um, and you know, I, it is funny. I, I want to talk about Eric Hilton a little bit, because this is one of my favorite stories about a student. So I met Eric about 1994, uh, 
and I think he was applying to graduate school to, to join a lab in the fall of 1996, or maybe it was 97, I don't remember. And he came to me and said, he'd done his undergraduate work at, at UMass, and he came to me and said, I want to come to your lab for a master's to learn how to make vertebrate skeletal material. And I said, well, that sounds fascinating because I love making skeletons, right? It's a fun job. I'm not very good at it, never as good as Eric is. Eric's really a master. But he came to me with this request and I said, that's great. So he joined my lab and within six months, we discovered a project together on sturgeons that became central to Eric's existence to this day because Eric is an authority on sturgeons, having collected them all over the world and worked away on their anatomy. They're incredibly frustrating from a phylogenetic perspective. I mean, sturgeons are notoriously variable, so the species are hard to identify. Um, and, um, you know, they come in very small sizes and really big sizes. And it's, the, the relationships among them are difficult to sort out using conventional molecular tools because they have duplicated chromosomes. They're, they're multiploidy. They have poly, you know, polyploid organisms, and they that makes it very difficult. Uh, da, 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 there are all kinds of problems. That's why I stopped working on sturgeons. They're too difficult. But Eric hasn't stopped. He's been working on them ever since. And um, I think that that's that's a happy story for me because we went off to a conference in Germany the next summer, and he presented the work. It was well received, and it's um, you know it's an important paper that we contributed. Now there is one story about papers and where to publish them. This paper was published by a colleague of ours, a friend of mine, who keeps the tightest copyright um, handle on things of anybody I know. So even though that paper was published in 1997, I can't send you a copy of it. You have to buy a copy from my friend in Germany. And I understand what's going on for him. You know, this is his livelihood. He's a scientist as well. But it's been very frustrating to me because that particular paper has a table in it that's been widely, widely copied. And it's right from that paper. Did a lot of people like cite it and a lot of people read it? Yeah, I think what happened is one guy who's really famous picked it up, put it in his book. And so now everybody cites ah, his book. Cites his book. <laughs> he, he politely that's... gave us credit to this paper, but I can't send it to anybody. Uh, you know? That's a bummer. That, that's, that's a bummer. What's next for you, Willie? Are you just going to, do you have any future plans? Well, uh, so, so I, you know, I had such a great time working on that textbook. Um, and part of it was, it was the perfect COVID project. You know, I'd get up every morning as early as I could be out here at the computer working on text or drawings all day long, 12 hour days for two years. You know, it was wonderful. I'm kind of obsessive. So I guess, so that's probably why, uh, why I enjoyed this so much, but it, it's been getting a good reception. I don't really know yet. I haven't seen any royalty checks, so I really don't know, but, um, I'm happy it's out there and my students seem to like it. I, I use it in my classes here. Uh, and I want to try to, you know, I mean, one of my interests in digital learning is to leverage other technologies to reach people all over the world. Like I really want that 182 country business again, if I can get it. And, you know, MOOC funding has dried up. I think interest in MOOCs has gone sort of, you know, not as high as it was. Um, I think people still want them, but, you know, they're expensive to produce. As I was going to ask, you know, the people still want to take them, but there's you're saying that the, the interest has kind of been lost from the people supporting them or the people funding them, right? Is that what you mean? I, I think that's a fair statement. At least that's my perspective, right? I may, others may have, have other perspectives on this, but um, you need to make it possible to produce really good material. So we were very fortunate because we had just enough budget for the first one to do a credible job. But I want, I want a half a million bucks to do it. That's where I am with this. I need a large amount of money to do everything from scratch. And I can do a lot of it, but you know, the money's not going to come. I don't think, um, the money's not even there in textbooks anymore that it once there that there, there once was. You know, there's this rather terrific and I think a little overstated reaction to textbook pricing. I had textbooks in the '70s that were a hundred dollars a piece. That was a long time ago. So when people are upset about a hundred dollar textbook now, I'm like, hey, you know, 
you get it's always been like that, but except that they're not as expensive as they as they once were. Well, even twenty five years ago, when I was in university, you know, we were paying you know two three hundred dollars, you know, sometimes four hundred dollars for a textbook. You know, that's we're trying to hit the one fifty market. Yeah, and that and then of course there's some really clever and great distribution systems that can knock that price down further for students, but. Um, you know, well, all that means is that the resources to develop new textbooks are, are smaller. So I think what I want to do is I want to find some way to make uh, that textbook come alive digitally for people. We have digital resources, of course, that go with the book. But um, I think a live conversation about it could be really exciting. You know, uh, I've been teaching this stuff one way or another for the better part of 50 years. And so I've made a lot of mistakes and I have a lot of perspectives about you know how you could possibly make this more interesting for people. Um, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I, 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 I'm, I have some ideas, but I think there's too, fo- too poorly formed to really discuss right now. We always like to ask our guests, like sort of the last sort of kind of wrap up here is that what advice would you have for students considering a career in the field? People come to me often now saying, I don't know how to have a career in marine science or ichthyology or vertebrate biology or whatever. Is there still going to be any demand for that when I'm done with my degree? And the short answer is the one that Harvey gave me 50 years ago. I asked him that question. I said, so am I going to be able to get a job when I get through with these degrees? And he said, oh, the unemployment rate in academics is about the same as it is in everything else. So if you're in the top 95%, you're probably going to have a job. And I thought that was pretty funny at the time, but I think it's by and large true. And we have a lot, we tell ourselves a lot of stories about how difficult jobs are to get. Well, I got a job in the middle of a terrible recession in the eighties. I had to apply to 60 schools to get that job, but I got a great job. And I would say that, you know, fear about uh, the future viability of a career in this field, uh, you should match that fear with the idea that you're going to get to get up every morning and think about fish, which is a rare privilege. And, you know, I I have to say, I've had an absolutely wonderful life. I really have enjoyed my career. I've enjoyed all my students and I get to work on these fascinating animals. So pretty hard to beat. Yeah, it's it's definitely one of the most rewarding careers to be in. That's for sure. That's terrific, Wally. That's just awesome. We really enjoyed uh, having, having you on this thing and we could probably talk for another hour easily on some of the stuff. So that, oh. that means, that means we'll have to, we'll have to have you come back sometime and have a round table. Oh, on some okay. of the, uh, some of the old, uh, the, some of the quote old timers here, people that <laughs> come before us and stuff, um, share some stories. I think would be, would be a lot of fun. I'd love to do that. And it's such great. It's so great to see you. You know, I've always appreciated the things that you've done and I really think this lost shark project is incredibly cool. So glad you're doing that as well as the podcast. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks again. For okay. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. you for joining us. And, and like we said, we'd love to have you back. Um, but uh, if people want to connect with you, I'm going to leave the links uh, in the show notes. But Instagram is probably the best way to connect. With Absolutely. You, right? okay. I, 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 I am Willie from Freeville. Perfect. With <laughs> underscores between the words. Love it. Love it. And yeah, I, I wanted to did not. I wanted to distance myself somewhat from, you know, from my professional address because. Yeah. Uh, I want to post about woodworking as well, well as sharks. And if you, you want to see the yeah, and if you want to see the tools that Willie has, go to his Instagram. I was on it this morning, yeah. and it's all of all the different types of woodworking tools. I think you can imagine. I think Willie has. And, so uh, no, no, it's actually a very small collection compared and, to many people. Right, but I uh, I've had fun fun building it up over the years. Yeah, yeah very good, great. very good. All right, okay. Well, great thank skills. you so much Thanks. for joining. Thanks us. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it.